Alec, I was hoping we could start with you. Um, you've been very busy going around the country, um, and I've written about some of the things that you've done in terms of he, when he uses lawsuits to challenge many money-based systems in different parts of our country. And that can include bail, and it can also include uh, probation practices in which people have to pay a fee uh, in order to keep their probation going. And so, Alec, I wanted to ask you if you could perhaps talk a bit about your work and also if you could give us maybe one or two examples of how, these, how this can actually impact actual people. Sure. Uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks to the Book and Historical Society for having us. Uh, I think before we begin any conversation about um, stories and about how people are affected and about our work, it's important to acknowledge some of the broader context. We heard a little bit of it from the public advocate, from Peter. Um, this country puts human beings in cages at rates that are unprecedented in the recorded history of the modern world. And these cages are grotesque torture chambers. Um, they are places where these human beings are sexually and physically assaulted, denied adequate medical and mental health care, denied basic food, natural light, contact with their family members. All of us are complicit in allowing our society to do this to other human beings. And I think the one defining characteristic, and Alicia has written about a lot of the work that we've done around the country, I've probably, I think, sued 15 or 20 uh, different cities um, in 15 or 20 different class action civil rights lawsuits to target um, this system of mass human caging that we've allowed to, to develop in this country. And the defining characteristic that I see in all of those places is an extraordinary desensitization to what a brutal thing it is to do to put another human being in a cage. And I think if there's an easy one sentence way to explain the work that we do, it's, it's to use civil rights laws to resensitize our legal system to that brutality, that everyday routine brutality that we've allowed to endure. And so um, when I first started doing this, this kind of work um, three years ago with, with that goal in mind to, with some amount of urgency and relentlessness to attack these systems in new and innovative ways to uh, you know, get us to think differently about mass human caging, um, I, first thing I did was I booked a plane ticket to Alabama. And uh, I uh, put on my hooded sweatshirt and I drove around from court to court and I just sat in the back of courtrooms and uh, I, had, I made it my way to Montgomery where I used to be a public defender and I walked into the local court and that morning that I happened to walk in there, there were 67 people in jail garb and chains in the courtroom. It's a huge docket size, would be pretty small docket size for arraignment part in, in New York City, but in Montgomery it was a huge amount of people. Not a single one of them were accused of a crime. All of them were African American. They were all there because they owed unpaid traffic tickets to the city. And I watched one by one, they came up to the, the, the I'll call him a judge, um, and uh, one by one they said, uh, please uh, don't put me in jail, I'm a single mother of four children, my child um, is disabled, I need to be home. Please, I'm a homeless veteran, I don't have any money. Um, I watched one man, um, who, a disabled man, who could barely walk, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm disabled, I, I, I only, the only income I have is from my federal disability check, Lord, have mercy on me, please, Your Honor, um, don't put me in jail, have mercy on me. And the judge screamed at him and said, unless you get $500 down here immediately, I'm throwing you in jail. And um, for reasons that I won't go into here, I was kicked out of the courtroom shortly thereafter. <laughs> and um, I snuck up into the jail, and I talked to a couple of these, these people, and, and um, I met that man, for example. And um, he, he didn't know what to make of me. I was in a hooded sweatshirt and didn't look like a lawyer, and no lawyer had ever been offered to help him. And so. Um, we had to call his pastor so his pastor could Google me. Um, and <laughs> luckily, just it had happened that week, Harvard had put up some, some note about me on their, on their website because um, they had just given me some money to go to Alabama to investigate this. So his pastor saw that I was for real and he talked to me. And <laughs> um, then I met another woman and, and I'll never forget, um, I think this, this woman's story really uh, captures uh, everything we're here to talk about tonight. And her name was Sharnell Mitchell. And um, she came in and um, she, Again, didn't know what to make of me, but eventually got around to telling me a little bit about her life. And she showed me her court document. Her court document said, pay us $2,807 or sit 59 days in jail. And she explained she'd been sitting on her couch with her one-year-old in her lap and her four-year-old next to her. Uh, and uh, the police raided her home. And they took her to jail because she owed traffic tickets from 2010. She hadn't paid them. And she was so desperate to get back to her children, she, she turned her court 
paper over her and, and in pencil that one of the jailers had given her, she was writing the days one through 59 on the sheet of paper. And on the top right corner, she was taking 2,807 and she was subtracting 50, 50, 50, because they give you $50 a day um, uh, credit toward your debt. And, and some days she was writing 75, 75, and she was subtracting them, trying to figure out when she was getting home. And I said, Charnel, why are you writing 75 someday? And she said, well, once you get into jail and you owe them money, if you agree to be a janitor for the city, uh, they give you an extra $25 a day. And um, she explained how, um, she explained this system of indentured servitude that Montgomery, Alabama was running in 2014. And uh, by the time we finished talking, this piece of pencil paper was just completely smudged with her tears. I took a photograph of it, and um, I, I, Charnel and the other man and two other people I met that day in jail before I also got kicked out of the jail, uh, became my first four clients as a civil rights lawyer. And we filed a federal civil rights lawsuit in Montgomery. Um, I took a photo of that document from the jail uh, and showed it to the federal judge. And um, the federal judge was so outraged, he ordered all of the officials to appear in front of him. Instead of doing that, they released everyone from the jail in one day. And imagine um, what, what that says about our society that in one day, a city cares so little about why it put people into jail that it's just willing to, to release them all. I mean, what does that say about the reasons that we've started requiring, uh, or better yet, the reasons we've stopped requiring before doing something like putting someone in a cage? And, and um, when Mr. Brown, um, the man who I had watched beg for mercy and pray to the Lord, who called his pastor, um, when he was walking out of the federal court that day, because we brought him there, he, he paused in the, the uh, entryway of the federal court building and he said, uh, I never knew I had so much power. He just mumbled that to himself under his breath. And um, that is, is what all of the work that we do is about. And so we've gone all around the country from Ferguson to New Orleans to San Francisco to Houston to Chicago to Massachusetts and everywhere almost in between. And we've been filing lawsuits and working with local community organizers and advocates and lawyers trying to build power around some of these issues and trying to give voice to some of the extraordinary injustices that, that our society is visiting on human beings and their bodies. Alec was talking about some of his work around the country and I was curious if you, you have a lot of experience here in New York City and since we're a New York audience, I was hoping you could give us maybe some of your experience and context and how these sort of policies play out here in our own backyard. I mean, Ms. James was talking earlier about bail reform and uh, the proposals that have been put forth and um, perhaps will eventually be put into place. But I was hoping you could maybe tell us about your experiences. I know you've, you've actually talked to police officers. What, what do people say when, when you bring this kind of thing up? Well, actually, I'm doing this out of necessity. Uh, it's absolutely necessary for black people to galvanize, not only in the city of New York, but across this country to build our political and economic power in order to change our outcomes positively. Because if we wait on courts, if we wait on judges, if we wait on nonprofits, if we wait on the educational system, if we wait on fancy universities, we will continue to rot in prison, be redlined out of neighborhoods, and be given inferior education and mass incarcerated. So I am in this in order to build power to our people. So what I have seen, particularly in New York City, and, and, and unfortunately, just to take up what you know, BK Bail Fund says, it's actually unfortunate. This environment actually doesn't lend itself to really changing any condition. Because everyone in this room, full well, there are no news flashes here. Was anyone shocked by what you heard so far? Anyone? No, we know full well that it's nothing but black and Latinos in jail and natives and in prison and being mass incarcerated. You know it when you see white people go through the subway at 42nd Street after seeing a Broadway show and go through the gate, but you see people at 149th Street and 3rd Avenue be arrested when they have a medical appointment and don't have a Metro card. We've all seen that play out. This is not new to any of us. So when we address precincts and precinct commanders directly, and I call that confrontation for a reason, because the criminal justice system's entry point is the NYPD in New York. That's the entry point 
Um, any interaction you may have with them may very well spell your entry into the criminal justice system, whether or not you can afford bail, uh, whether you end up in jail, in prison, with summonses, fines, etc. So they engage in what I call a lot of psychological warfare, which we have challenged directly and say, hey, wait a minute. We have the right to control how you conduct yourself in our community, not the other way around. Because so far, what word I haven't heard yet tonight is racism. Racism. And let's be clear on that. I know that you know these panels are, are somewhat of a comfort space for people because it doesn't get gritty in here. <laughs> but it's about racism, all right? So the NYPD are the pit bulls of racist people that benefit from the power structure that subjugates black people and by extension, brown people. These are facts at this point. We don't need any new facts and evidence. The discussion at this point is, when are we going to stop it? Politicians come in the room. Yes, Tish James came in the room and used a lot of buzzwords, discussions, conversations, reform. Let's be clear, why accountability? We're abolitionists. This system must be abolished. Abolished. And that's not a conversation. That's about saying that everyone that has a low level drug offense gets released by December 31st, 2016. Simple as that. But why don't we do it? Because we know that incarcerated black people benefit the white power structure in the United States. Let's be honest. We have to be honest about that and stop pussyfooting around it. Corporations do business in prisons. You know, all the hot topic is private prisons, private prisons. No, McDonald's just doesn't do work in private prisons. So corporations, Victoria's Secret, McDonald's, all benefit from people incarcerated. So there has to be a human trafficking element to get you into that system to provide free labor. Just like, a, just like chattel slavery in 1795. All right? It ain't new Jim Crow, it's the same old Jim. It's the same old Jim. So the NYPD, how it manifests to answer your question is, they want everybody to feel good about crime fighting and not get to the nitty gritty about their racist practices. One of the things that we've identified within the transit district is what I call predatory policing. As I explained, you may see NYPD hiding behind columns. They'll go into janitorial closets. They'll hide and huddle under pay phones in order to catch fair beaters. That's your entry into the criminal justice system. That's how they body snatch you. They don't do that at 42nd Street after Spider-Man gets out, or after Hamilton gets out, or after Color Purple gets out. They don't do that. It happens at 149th and 3rd. It happens at 138th and 3rd. It happens at Junction Boulevard. It happens at 125 and Lex. It happens at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when all the high school kids are getting out of school at 116th and Lex. And the cops even dress, calling themselves dressing like homeboys with backpacks and Timberlands. Happens at Stillwell when all the black kids are trying to get home to Coney Island. But it doesn't happen at Brighton, a few stops away, it doesn't happen. So we know this already. And I like the word that Alex used, complicit. We are complicit. Because as long as you continue to call for a discussion or a conversation, you're engaging in the system that disenfranchises black people and by extension, brown people. So that's why, why accountability gets confrontational. Because it's a life and death situation for us. Because we cannot wait 
for these authorities or these bodies to keep conversing, or I believe Miriam Webster added conversate. I think it's in there now. We can't wait. We can't wait for that. We really cannot, okay? Maybe 27 months ago, I might have said something else, standing on my master's degree in political science. That's fancy. I might have said something else. But when you can watch a man on camera beg for his life over nothing, because I don't want anyone repeating it was over cigarettes, because if you watch the video, when Pantaleo and company dug in his pockets, he didn't have anything. Watch that video again. So it was over nothing. When we can watch that, and the streets are not loaded with hundreds of thousands of people for weeks and months and years. We are all complicit. So I know black struggle is the new hot and sexy. It's hot and sexy now. It's all in our uh, liberal circles. But at the end of the day, you're not doing a damn thing about it but eating pigs in the blanket and little hors d'oeuvres and want to be on the pulse of the up-to-date conversations. But you're not going to Rikers calling for people to be released because you have to dig through your soul and ask yourself, am I really still scared of Raheem? Does Raheem really still scare me? Because really, that's why you didn't give a shit that he was locked up. Because you know you're scared of him. You know that the United States owes a debt to the descendants of chattel slavery in the United States. So as long as we're incarcerated, redlined, miseducated, we won't have the power to get what we are due. That's why this cycle continues to perpetuate. That's why NYPD is on the front line of body snatching us into that system because it stalls the inevitable, which is reparations for 450 years of uncompensated labor and redlining and Jim Crow and mass incarceration and war on drugs and miseducation. Shannon, sorry. We cool with that though? <laughs> Everybody feeling me? Well, I'm going to pivot slightly from that. Um, but it's a somewhat similar question in that I wanted to ask Gabriel, um, he's been because he's been working in, in this sort of area in, in terms of some of the different criminal justice policies we've seen over the past couple of decades, and that's how long you've been working in it. And one of the questions I have, and you went through, Shannon, so much of the history, and it's all so important, and I'm curious, in the past couple decades, if you could talk a little bit about how we got to this point where actual, where we see so many policies that clearly are, are money-based policies. I mean, bail's been around a long time, but was it always so that pe privatized pro probation or that there were other similar money-based policies that, did those arise recently, or just if you could give us some context to that? Sure, good evening. Uh, my name is Gabriel Say, I run an organization uh, called the Katal Center for Health Equity and Justice, we're based here in New York. Um, thank you for bringing that into the room. Uh, there's a, a, a piece I would like to add to that, if I can, which is the, there is, we're here at the Brooklyn Historical <laughs> Society, so it is worth thinking back to the way that history shapes the current moment. And there's a very interesting and beautiful um, presentation upstairs about uh, slavery and the Emancipation Proclamation. And it's relevant th for this conversation, given the connections that were just pointed out between uh, slavery and the current system of mass incarceration. A thing that happened 40 or 50 years ago was that we made a decision as a society to assign uh, responding to issues of poverty and behavioral health and mental health issues and addiction issues to the criminal justice system as the primary system of response. We made that decision pretty directly as a society, both in terms of policy and politics. It was 
Mo it's mostly referred to as what happened when Nixon declared a war on drugs, but there was a whole set of other factors at play there that were largely in response to the Civil Rights Revolution, which was itself emergent <clears throat> as a response to the maintenance of a system of Jim Crow that was a response to the Emancipation Proclamation, right? So we're supposed to have ended slavery, and then there was a system of Jim Crow, and then the Civil Rights Revolution emerged, and there was a response to that, a kickback, a, a counter-revolution, so to speak. The war on drugs is frequently referred to as the touch, uh, touchstone for that, but there was a whole set of things that were occurring during that period that culminate into a decision that was made as a society to respond to poverty, essentially, through the criminal justice system. The, the other side of that was not just the expansion of the carceral state in the United States of America, it was the dismantling of the social welfare state that had been really at the heart of the New Deal. Things that we have come to understand as being normal things as Americans that were likely more normal for people that my grandparents and my great-grandparents age, but really not so much my parents and certainly not for me, were things like people get a job in America and you can get some health care and you can get a house and you can get help if you need it. And when you actually scratch the surface of that, I think we all sort of understand that that's not quite the case any longer. But what mass incarceration represents is the system that was put into place to respond to those very real problems that we have when those problems, when those, uh, when problems emerge related to poverty and uh, mental health and other health issues. The concurrence here of, of what's happened in the last 50 years is an extraordinary um, uh, a deepening of economic inequality in this country. And when you take that factor and you combine it with the fact that, as you noted, that we've never actually dealt with slavery, and what that means in terms of all the bad things and horrific things that we see with uh, Jim Crow and mass incarceration today, we, well, white people in particular, what we never talk about is the way that us not dealing with slavery as a society has disfigured us as human beings and really disfigured our humanity and really undermined our ability as people, as white people, to understand and relate to the horrific things that happen on an everyday basis to people of color. And so we wake up in a way, in a day-to-day in a day -to -day basis, in a way that we can say, it's really terrible that Khalif Browder spent three years in, on Rikers, two of them in solitary confinement, uh, for a crime that was later dropped, for, he was accused of stealing a backpack, and this child was held there for three years because his mother couldn't pay bail, and he got out and killed himself because of the trauma. And we know that that's wrong, and it, and it represents something that's horrific, but to your point, we're not having like mass uprisings and riots in the streets right now in the city of New York saying that we should close Rikers, which is a campaign I work on, but damn it, we really should. But that disfigurement to our humanity as white people, I think, has really inhibited our ability to understand what's really wrong here. And it's also really complicated our ability to forge alliances with people of color to do what's right. And oh, thankfully, there's this moment where nationally we're having this uh, gl more global conversation at, the, at a national level about race and e economics. And there's a presidential election, which seems to have some of the best and worst of some of those conversations uh, play out in different ways. Uh, but to your, to your question, I, it's, it's almost impossible to separate out that question of how did, how did the criminal justice system lead to people like those that Alec was seeing down in, in Montgomery being stuck because they, they're there for traffic tickets. Like, how does that happen? There's certain policy things that were decided that occurred, yes. And there's certain politics that play out at a very local level that are horrific that happen. That's, that's true as well. But there's this larger context that we're operating within um, which has everything to do with race and has everything to do with the decisions that we've made uh, as, uh, about how we want to deal with these things and what responsibilities we've assigned to the criminal justice system over the last 50 years. And I'll end with this, which is that to the extent that we expect the criminal justice system to solve all of these problems, we are getting the exact thing that we should have anticipated getting out of that deal that was made. And when I say we, it gets to the comment that both Alec and, and Sharon made about, uh, Sh Shannon? Sharon. Mm -hmm. uh, Shannon uh, made about uh, that we're all complicit in this. So it's not that, um, I don't mean to say that there was a wide agreement that everyone in society agreed to these things. What I am saying is that as a society, we have a collective responsibility to do something about these things. It's where I think the bail funds work is really important 
because they're actually doing something about this and trying to address bail and raise the profile of, of, uh, of the problem uh, in the city here. Alex's work uh, suing the crap out of systems all over the, the country is important. Shan's work in the Bronx and, the, and this stuff they're doing to try to go into these uh, 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 police uh, uh, council meetings, which, how many of you have ever been to one of those meetings? So that's really interesting. Like, as Horrific an people, I only saw two hands. <laughs> but as an action step, like that's something that people could do even leaving the room. It's like learn how they do it in the Bronx and learn what you can do just locally. Uh, but we all have this collective responsibility to do something about these things. And I think to the extent that we can take actions both large and small, uh, we can begin to disrupt this agreement that was made 50 years ago and begin to outline and envision what it would look like if we were to have a different arrangement where we were not assigning the criminal justice system the primary responsibility to respond to these things. For white people, what does it look like if we assume a particular degree of responsibility for accounting for historical things that, yes, maybe my family didn't do X, Y, or Z, but here we are in America, and it's 2016, and Eric Garner just got choked to death, and Khalif Browder died, and we see what's going on all over the country. And so the money aspect is really critical. And it's basic enough to understand. I mean, look, there's people that destroy the economy and they get $500 million bonuses, right? And homeowners lose their houses. I mean, that's not an equation that you need to be a mathematician to understand. We understand that math pretty easily. So take that math and apply it then to criminal justice and you sort of get what's going on here. If you're poor, you're screwed. But it's not just about having money. It's about all the other things that that ends up being connected to. Um, and so that, that's where I think this, these conversations are really important. I think, to, again, to her point, I think we really do got to push ourselves to be a little uncomfortable in these conversations. And for white folks in particular, I think we bear a unique responsibility in this historical moment to step up and try to find our way, which is not also about us finding our humanity with each mm -hmm. other. And to the extent that we can do that, I think that we can exercise a degree of solidarity with people of color that they've been asking for from us for a very, very long time. And I think that we can rise to that, but it's, we have to work towards it. Thanks. Uh, Shaneri, I wanted to ask you about something that I think um, sometimes gets overlooked in this discussion about, um, for example, when we were Department of Justice last year, the report on Ferguson, where we learned about all of the different very shameful practices, really, of extracting revenue from people through minor traffic fines. And my point is, that's something that gets discussed more and more. And um, I wanted to talk to you about some of the money-based practices that occur um, following someone's release from prison. I think that they get discussed a little bit less, but they're uh, just as important. Yeah, um, so first I would like to say thank you for being here. The conversation is really enriching, <laughs> um, and I have enjoyed it so far. Um, so to answer, that question real specifically, I think that we do hear a lot about what happens or some of the work that um, is happening around bail and what does it mean to be incarcerated. Um, but I've worked with young people for a really long time. And one of the things that actually is touted as a solution, but really we know that it isn't, to incarceration is like electronic monitoring for example, which for many people, they're like, that's really wonderful, they're not in jail, you're able to be out, but there's a cost attached to that. Um, very often, you're paying $15, $20 a day to be able to have the device, to rent the device. And for people who can't afford that, and for young people particularly, um, it continues to add cost. It continues to make it really detrimental for them to be able to live, work in the world. Um, so that's like one of the costs. There's also, when thinking about the cost of incarceration, we very often forget about the cost that's put on the families, right? So more recently, I worked with um, a mother who her son is incarcerated in Texas and she lives in Louisiana and she has to call, she calls her son once a week. And the cost of those calls are exorbitant. Up until recently, they were about two dollars to between two to five dollars, depending on the company, um, and a minute. So just a ten-minute call would cost her hundreds of dollars a month to be able to call her son every week. We have families that have racked up bills of twenty-five thousand dollars to be able to stay connected to their families. 
Um, and then there's lots of families that can't do that at all because it costs so much money to be able to stay connected. When thinking about like the broader conversation before you asked that one is really around just the, con the connection between poverty and race, right? And that that's, seems to be the conversation that we're having here. Um, and racism was talked about a little bit, but we also have to understand that we live in an economy that is extractive in its very nature. It was built on the extraction of labor, um, which was talked about somewhat when we're talking about um, chattel slavery, but it, it continues in that way, right? It's all around how do we continue to build up profit for larger organizations, larger corporations, and taking that um, from the poor. So when thinking about incarceration, there's so many different places in which people are hit, from bail being one example, to the cost of phones, to being able to um, work or not work, and what that means for the family members that are not incarcerated, to what happens when you're out and have to pay restitution. Um, very often, there are when you're incarcerated, you're given also a fine of restitution to the family, depending if to the family or to a company, if you were caught stealing something, and then having to pay that back leaves a lot of people unable to pay, and then back incarcerated um, because they break, the, they break their parole um, because of that, because of their inability to pay. And that just continues to, to really build up the current system um, and really hinders and hurts like poor people. And in particular, poor people of color, and then in this country, even more specific, black folks, right? Um, so I think that it's just a continual cycle. Um, if we wanted to get into a conversation around like how to break some of those cycles, some of that was discussed earlier around really being able to address and look at racism, um, to be able to really address and look at the harms of um, slavery, the harms of white supremacy, the harms of capitalism that has affected all of us, um, and not just being able to look at incarceration. Currently, thinking about like incarceration and mass incarceration is a really hot topic, right? You hear about it everywhere, um, from um, pundits who are conservative to really liberal folks kind of coming together on the conversation of incarceration, but the conversations that aren't happening, which I'm really happy have, have been brought up here, are conversations that lie deeper in the why, right? And that why is rooted in racism and structural racism. I'd like... <laughs> I'd like to ask all of you guys, um, you know, one of the things I'm curious about is just whether there's anywhere in the country that you guys have noticed or um, that has actually done some things that have made a difference um, that would maybe be a place to look for solutions. No. I'll go first. Hell no. I went to... <laughs> uh, we went down why accountability went down for Freddie Gray. Uh, in short, hell, hell no. <laughs> um, so, is there a place in the country where you can look at it and be like, oh my God, what they're doing right now is amazing? I'm gonna agree, no, right? Now, <laughs> what does exist are places where you start to get hints of what's possible. And for me, that's, that's exciting, right? So we're seeing in um, Chicago, for example, the fact that there were um, cases of reparations being paid to people who were incarcerated unjustly, right? And being able to understand that incarceration um, and torture is unfair and being able to get reparations for that is, is exciting because we know that that's not the only case of where that has happened in the country and that's not the only case where it's happened in Chicago, right? So to me, I look at that as like a light bulb place. If I think of right now, the MacArthur Foundation has given grants of three million plus to cities across the country, really thinking about what does it mean to look at incarceration in their cities. And the city of Philadelphia is really looking at, well, what does it mean to move away from money bail, right? And there's lots of conversations that are happening. They're looking at examples across the country. That's exciting. Now, hopefully they get it right and we don't know yet. There are conversations and experiments um, that are in practice, but it's an opportunity to continue to push. The fact that the conversation is happening is really exciting. For me, what's even more exciting outside of like how we're looking at 
um, ending the criminalization of, of poor people is that we're actually also having conversations about what does it mean what does policing mean, right? Mm -hmm. Sharon talked about how our first um, interactions with the criminal justice system are very often police officers, right? They're the ones who are arresting you, they're the ones who you enter through, right? And if we can figure out, well, what is their role in society? How, what does it mean to be safe? How are we securing our communities in a way that the role of the police officers, if they need to exist, which I challenge they do not, but if they need to exist, then the role is around how are we keeping each other safe and creating community instead of having punitive officers and people who are here to just um, arrest us or here to um, be able to enact some kind of punitive, um, oh, the word just left my head, sorry. <laughs> um, to be able to really just arrest us and to be able to enter us into that incarceration system, right? So those are places to me where I get a little bit of hope um, so that over the next 10, 15 years, if the work continues, if it doesn't become just a hot thing and a hot topic at the moment, which it currently is, and we really are able to look inside and deal with conversations of race and really question the role of policing and communities and who we lock up and who we don't, um, I think that there will be examples and places we can say they're doing it right. Is swipe it forward, okay? Uh, beginning on May 11th, Grassroots groups across the city got together to say no to predatory policing in the transit system by NYPD, okay? It's been done six times, and we're doing a citywide day of action on November 2nd, and this is what we mean by keeping our community safe, because as people, we've collectively determined that we're not gonna waste any time trying to convince the Transit Bureau of the NYPD that they need to stop treating us like animals in the wild, like it's National Geographic. And we're gonna take proactive steps to ensure that there are no quotas, no summonses that day, and no arrests that day. So we're gonna swipe it forward, and what we're showing ourselves as a community is that we can keep ourselves safe, and we're not gonna allow that entry point into the criminal justice system on that day. So we're encouraging everyone on November 2nd, if you have an unlimited Metro card, swipe somebody in on your way out. If you have a pay per ride, you can swipe whoever you want. And that's on <laughs> November 2nd. So that was, I jumped in there because that was the question. What purpose do, do the police serve? Because particularly in the city of New York, many of the arrests are you know, what we call broken windows offenses. Open container, urinating in public, fair beating, riding a bike on the sidewalk, which happens to notoriously people of color. We don't see the police department doing this to people riding their bikes on Park Avenue, weaving in and out of the street onto the sidewalk and back into the street. About you just don't see it. So that's another element of the structural racism. So that's where we're saying, hey, wait a minute. We are gonna take action in order to protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe because we cannot rely on this structure to do so because it is designed. Let's be clear. That's the difference between reform and abolition. Abolition concludes that it is by design that this system churns to abuse us. Therefore, it must be abolished, dismantled, wrapped up, thrown in la basura, and we have to do something else, okay? So I had to put that in there. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, I'm fairly pessimistic about some of the larger, uh, uh, I mean, as an abolitionist also, I just, I, I think we have to do every, you know, use every ounce of energy we have in our bodies and all of our skills and knowledge we've accumulated over the years to attempt it. But um, the system is so powerful and it finds new ways to reproduce these mechanisms of oppression. And so I've seen some really positive things in a lot, you know, we just settled uh, a big lawsuit with the city next to Ferguson where we're getting $4.75 million for 1,900 people, almost all of whom are black, who were caged illegally by the city next to Ferguson. Um, so there's, there's, and they ended money bail, we closed down their jail basically, they don't use it anymore. Um, there's positive things, right? But um, the, the, the problem is that um, the, the, these systems are so entrenched 
everywhere else in the country. We just filed a lawsuit against Cook County in Chicago. There's 9,000 human beings in their jail every night, um, two Fridays ago. And to, to fix a system like that, to fix the rest of the country, um, it's going to take an incredible effort. And it, it just can't really be done by lawsuits and lawyers. It has to only be done by building power in communities. Because if you just win a lawsuit, you'll see something like Brown versus Board of Education, which apparently declared that you can't have segregated schools anymore in 1954. And yet, 60 years later, you go to any major American jurisdiction, and the schools are um, almost completely segregated. And um, you, know, you, you, you can have a Supreme Court case that says um, you, you can no longer tell people you can't vote because of your skin color. But then you have laws passed saying, well, OK, but you can't vote if you've been found by the police to have possessed a certain plant that we're going to put on a list of plants that you can't possess. And now all of a sudden, you, take, uh, you only arrest people with a certain skin color for possessing that plant, and you've now recreated the same system that was overruled by a court case. So lawyers, I think, in particular, have to be really sensitive to their own limitations. What we can do is we can bring these cases, we can alleviate some suffering, but we have to bring the cases in a way that, that builds power for people like the other people on this, uh, you know, on this panel, because uh, without that, they're just going to be... And, and I think the best example of that is um, I was invited for the first and... Um, for reasons you'll understand in a second, probably the only time um, to the White House last year. And, um, you know, I, I, I was invited to give a little, a little talk at the, at the DOJ and, and then um, at, at the White House, and I, I typically call it the Department of Injustice. Um, I also call it the criminal injustice system. And I, for that day, I, I used the term DOJ, because I thought I was on my best behavior. Um, but the Attorney General got up and, and she started talking about um, how incredible it was, and I, I really loved what you said earlier, Shannon. She was talking about the conversation that we're having and this, we're here today to meet and to talk and to study the problem. And you know, these aren't problems that need any more studying, in my view. But, and, and they were all congratulating each other. And then in the middle of her talk, she said, I'm sorry, I have an update for you um, from the San Bernardino. I know you're all on the edge of your seats. You want to know the update from San Bernardino. And I said, I don't want to know that update. I, I want to talk about the 500,000 people that are being caged because of bail. But she gave us an update uh, over my objection. Um, and uh, it was that they had sent a, a team of FBI agents to San Bernardino, multiple teams, and they were investigating the shooter, and they had all this stuff, and she was giving us an operational update. It was incredible. You know, they're flying in from everywhere. They're investigating. And um, I raised my hand um, a little bit later, and I, and I said, you know, because there was another panel that all the White House people were patting themselves on the back for this conversation, and I said, um, you know, we're, we're having this conversation here. Um, but what do we do in our society when we conclude that a situation is an emergency? When we conclude that something urgent needs to happen, what do we do? We send in SWAT teams. We send in teams of FBI agents. We, we investigate. We rescue people, right? Um, I, do you all remember um, the, the guy in Cleveland a few years ago who had those women in his basement? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So, so imagine if, if um, after you leave here tonight, uh, you're, you're going home. I learned a lot. You know, I'm going to pay it forward uh, on the on the met, on the subway. We call it the metro in DC. Uh, and, and you thought I'm going to go to these these police council meetings. It's really great. You, you, you're, you're you're thinking. You're stimulated. You get home. You turn on the TV, and it turns out my my mugshot is on the TV. And it turns out while I was speaking to you, the police raided my home in DC. And like that guy in Cleveland, um, they found a dungeon in my house. And I had been kidnapping people of color off the street. And I'd been raping them. I'd been beating them. I've been giving them infectious diseases. I've been depriving them of food and sunlight. Um, you'd probably think differently of me. And some of you might even, the non-abolitionists might even support my prosecution and incarceration in a cage. Um, and, and you certainly would support a SWAT team coming in and rescuing those people from my dungeon, just like you probably were happy that the police rescued those women from that home in, in Ohio. And yet that is the situation in 3,000 local jails all over the country every single night. Before we sued the town of Jennings, the one that we just settled, they'd had four human beings die in that jail in, in recent two years because they couldn't afford a couple hundred dollars bail. Um, in, in the city of Houston, where, where we have a lawsuit right now, they had 55 human beings die in their jail pre-trial because they couldn't pay bail from 2009 to 2015. That's 12 people, 11 or 12 people every single year are dying in the Houston. The first business day after we filed a lawsuit in Cook County last week, someone died because they couldn't pay bail in Chicago. So that is the situation. And, and that's the level of urgency that we have to be attacking it. And, and I think we're, you know, people always say we're at this exciting moment. It's a real, there's a lot happening. But I think we're actually at a very dangerous moment. Because we're at a moment when 
um, we can be sort of satisfied with little tweaks and little reforms and little victories in cases like mine, and we'll, we'll lose sight of the incredible shift that we have to, to make as a society and an economy and a culture um, that is going to be the only way we actually address some of these mechanisms of oppression so that they don't reproduce themselves. So I, I'm a little pessimistic about whether we have it in us to accomplish that major shift, but I'm certainly going to give it my best shot. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more thing and then we're gonna let the audience ask questions. Um, I, but that all being said, I mean, I think a lot of people are probably wondering, but your Swipe It Forward campaign is something people could do. What, are, what else could people do besides converse about this? What, what could they, what action can people take? Film the cops all the time. Never stop, <laughs> upload it, and explain to people what they're looking at. What you're looking at is the racist NYPD body snatching another youth of color right after school. Contextualize it. We all have these, I know how much I pay in school loans. We all got these degrees, so we know how to contextualize them. So, film the cops, swipe it forward, uh, also support grassroots organizations that are doing the work. Since we got into, you know, other cities, what we have seen in other cities that is being mirrored in the city of New York is this co-opting of people power by the nonprofit industrial complex. Everybody knows what the prison industrial complex is, right? But you also have a nonprofit industrial complex where authorities, you can fill in the blank who those authorities are. They could be a mayor, it could be a governor, it could be the federal government, it could be a white liberal uh, philanthropist, it could be anybody that will prop up a nonprofit.org that has to file a 990 with the IRS in order to provide services and programs or mimic that they are about black liberation or police reform. But then in actuality, what they're doing is undermining liberation because they don't want to have straight talk conversations. At Why Accountability, one of our great barometers is if you can't say fuck the police out loud, we will not strategically plan with you. <laughs> if you can't say it, because then that means there's a purse string somewhere pulling you. So what we would have to do is support those organizations that are doing real grassroots work. And I'll tell you who they are. Nobody you see on TV. Because there is a media blackout on black grassroots since the chokehold death of Eric Garner. Remember the 60,000 people that went down 14th Street and up 6th Avenue on December 13, 2014? What happened to all those 60,000 people? Where did they go? That was the nonprofit industrial complex operating with the state authority to make it look like we was getting somewhere. No, we didn't get anywhere. Because since the chokehold death of Eric Garner, you've had David Felix, Akai Gurley, George Tillman, Deborah Danner, who am I forgetting? Delron Dempsey Small. So we've had five deaths by NYPD in 26 months. And we're not going nuts out here? Because you at the nonprofit industrial complex, it complicit with the media. Let's go there. Is have, have you guys ever seen me on TV? <laughs> and you're not going to because the conversations that I have are, are not suitable for white liberal media because they inspire people and black people to take control of themselves and control of their lives for their self-determination and liberation, not within the context of a nonprofit or a governmental authority. That's the difference. So if you wanna do something, swipe somebody in on your way out, maybe once or twice a week you pay that 275 for somebody, film the cops at all times, and be prepared. If you have an opportunity to have a public forum, denounce these things that you are seeing and speak from it rightfully. It's okay to be white and say, fuck this racist system. Say it. 
Not, well, you know, we're gonna have a conversation tomorrow night at seven o'clock and we're gonna, no, that's just reinforcing your social hierarchy that doesn't benefit the people affected and we have to stop that. So that's what you can do, step out your comfort zone. Film the cops. <laughs> Gentlemen. I didn't respond to the last question, not because I didn't have anything to say. I, we, we want to, I guess we want to move to audience questions. I'll say I'm a, I'm a, as an organizer, I'm an eternal optimist, <laughs> but I wake up with a pessimist hunger. Like, st like things are really bad, but I I'll believe that we can do things that are constructive. There's two things I want to highlight that I think are going really well, um, and I think can help us in terms of how, keeping from replicating systems of harm um, as we try to, to move towards something more effective. So for anybody that was doing work to try to do criminal justice reform 15 years ago, you could not say the term mass incarceration and get, certainly couldn't get any money from foundations, but you could barely say it and be taken seriously by elected officials or others. To move from that position for 15, 20 years ago to a place where the president is using that term is significant and it's important to understand that that term and the drive to get to that place came as much as there's a lot of nonprofit organizations and others doing fine work and maybe less than fine work, to your point. Um, it's formerly incarcerated people and their families that have really driven this stuff from the ground. I take tremendous inspiration from that and I think to the extent that we can watch what directly impacted people are doing and listen to them, follow their lead. It will help us avoid the worst problems of replicating a system that is harming people. There was just a conference in Oakland in September of, of formerly incarcerated and convicted people um, that was led by a group um, of formerly incarcerated folks that have been organizing for a long time. There were hundreds of people out there from across the country that gathered at this conference and I was fortunate and lucky enough to be there. And it was a tremendous inspiration to see the power of that convening and the leaders from across the country that were doing work in their own local areas, most of whom have never been on TV, never been anywhere where they, they had gotten the kind of focus and attention and, and respect and certainly the, the spotlight that they deserved. But they were in the grind doing it and doing amazing work that's transforming the heart of the nation. And I take, I, I just am deeply inspired by that. And I think if we look for that work and listen to those voices, we're gonna be far better off as we move to try to change what's going on. Here in New York, one thing I'm, I'm inspired about but also work on, so maybe there's, I'm biased in this regard, is that there's a growing effort to close Rikers Island here in the city. And it is critically important that we shut down that torture chamber. It is a torture chamber. There were 22,000 people on Rikers Island 10, 15 years ago. There's now 8,000 people on that island. We can shut it down. It is totally unnecessary. We can have a far more humane way of finding ways to hold people accountable in this city that do not include putting them in cages, to use Alex's term. Rikers Island is an abomination and the movement to close it is growing and it's getting a lot stronger across the, the city. So in terms of what folks can do, look for opportunities to speak out and call for closing Rikers Island, especially when you're going to, there's a city council election and a, a mayoral election next year. You all are folks here at the Brooklyn Historical Society. You're likely linked in to a number of things. Bring this stuff up in conversation to your point. Name it. Talk about it. Look for opportunities to contribute money to grassroots activists. And pay attention because there are some pretty shady things going on in terms of criminal justice reform here in this city. So not all the glitters is gold. So be careful. Um, and, when, and I think to the extent that you don't know what's happening, listen for the folks on the ground because usually that direction will help keep us, keep us right. So when thinking about the things that can be done and that you all can do, um, I'm going to talk about it in three different ways. So there's, inter inter, um, there's the internal work, and I think that that's been brought up a couple of times when thinking around, if we're talking, if we're really talking about racism and and when we're talking about the criminal justice system in this country, then we're having a conversation about racism, right? We're having a conversation about the historical trauma of white supremacy and slavery. So one of the things that we can start with is, and this is for everyone in here, is to learn, to heal, to grow, 
to reach in yourself and figure out why do you feel like people need to be in cages to begin with? Why um, are you okay with that? Why then do we, um, how do you deal with your interactions with other people? What are your either internalized racism um, and things that you have taken on, things that you believe about yourself, things that you believe about people who look like you, or the way in which you then believe, the way in which you have internalized um, other people, right? The ways in which you are yourself implicit in racial acts, whether that's um, your own bias or whether that's just because you grew up in this country and by doing so, we have all learned the same things. So being able to start with unlearning that, um, to grow from that, to be able to heal from that. And then from there, figuring out how do you work with other people, right? Whether that's um, teaching other folks, whether that's using resources that you have, whether that's monetary resources, or if you have resources as far as space, if you have resources as far as access to different places, access for venues for people to be able to talk, um, if you have access to equipment, whether that's computers or video equipment or things that other people don't, being able to use that in service of work um, is another thing that you can do, is to be able to give. The other one then is to support organizing, right? So we have a lot of different folks up here who come from, a different, from, come from different perspectives, but we all, just from what I'm hearing, agree that it starts at the bottom, right? We have to really empower and work with people who are the most impacted. And for a lot of us in here, if that's not you, that doesn't mean going to them and working with them. It means giving what they need so that they can figure it out themselves, right? Very often we want to come in as the saviors because it feels good, and that's really about us. So how do we be? How are we then able to empower those? And that's what it comes down to: just supporting organizing um, in a lot of different ways. Um, so those would be the, the three things that I think that everyone in here can do um, from all different walks of life. Okay, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, good evening. Thank you to the panel. You guys are doing wonderful work. Sharon, I think that's your name? Um, Shannon. Sh Shay? Shannon. Shay. Shay. Good old Irish name. <laughs> I, um, I recently left Brooklyn, I think in December last year. I moved from Clinton Hill and I moved to Mott Haven, the Bronx, and I, I think it was in May. I went to the community board meeting and I saw you there and you were on fire. Oh, snap. <laughs> it was the 4 0 meeting? The 4 0 preset meeting? Yes. When and they had it at, Ho at um, Lincoln Hospital. Lincoln Hospital. Mm. And the reason I went is because um, they were, I found out that there was um, a shelter that was transi transitioning to a sex offender shelter. And I wanted to know if the police had informed the community. And they were saying that they didn't know. But as soon as people left the auditorium, the, um, the lieutenant came over to me and he said, oh, by the way, I just found out we did know which I knew, apparently they knew the entire time and they didn't let the public know. So that's, I'm, just bear with me for a second. This morning, a 16 year old child, I don't know his race, his ethnicity, his name or anything else, he jumped in front of a train on 42nd Street and committed suicide. I'm the mother of a 17 year old boy. I used to live in Brooklyn. I used to attend Emmanuel Baptist Church that Letitia James spoke about. I still get those emails about the college information. We wanted to go last night, but we live in the Bronx, so we weren't coming out to Brooklyn for that. Although I work in Brooklyn, but my son goes to school in the city, so that wasn't an option for us. Um, my son also is very shy, and so leaving Brooklyn because we were priced out in December, we moved to the Bronx. Turns out that it's, it's a better fit for us, but it's a transition for him. So he's very shy and I'm always afraid that when he's on the train and he's not making eye contact or he's a little fidgety, you know, he looks suspicious to someone who doesn't know him. So we're going through, you know, we're looking for options for him to get him out of his, you know, his social awkwardness and we're, he's in therapy and the therapist is like, well, he's fine, he's just shy. I know that, but police don't know that. And there's not a day that he does not walk out the house that my, everything is like in my throat. He has to text me at every point, mom, I'm here, mom, I'm here, mom, I'm here. And I'm okay with that. So I'm thinking, well, you know what? I'm a little paranoid and I'm probably making him paranoid. So let me do something about this. So I found out that Columbia University has a clinic for social anxiety. And I called them and they said, oh, we have a teen group, bring him in. But there's an intake. 
and the intake interview is $525. And that's if they're going to tell me if he does or doesn't fit for that group. I'm very fortunate I was able to pay it. But we still don't know if he'll get into that group. But what I realized is that there were no other parents of color in that waiting room. There was just me. And there were a host of other parents, but there were no other parents of color. And so it concerns me because we talk about criminality and poverty. It stems somewhere. He's not a criminal. He's shy. He's awkward in large settings, but people don't know that. If you know him, you know, oh, that's just him, he's fine. But if you don't know him, he's suspicious. And he's not the only one. There are so many young men of color who are awkward in other, system, other settings. Because again, this, with this topic next week, um, segregation in New York City public schools. You go to a school in your neighborhood and you don't, you're not interacting with people of other ethnicities. So then when you get into other environments, you're nervous. Um, and so it brings me back to this morning a 16-year-old child jumped in front of a train, and the only thing I've read so far was that he seemed emotionally disturbed. So whether he was black, whether he was white, Latino, I don't know. I know it was a child that committed suicide because of some internal issues. And those are the issues that are not being addressed. And when um, mental issues are not being addressed, people are perceived as criminals, and oftentimes, whether they are arrested or they are limited in terms of the resources they have, they, they're able to attain, whether it's a job or education or even friends, because people, just people on the train will look at you if you're strange, if you're just not, if you're quote unquote socially awkward, you're automatically ostracized. Um, and then I forget the, the gentleman at the, at the end, and you spoke about people in Alabama in a myriad of cases, and I'm sure so many of them were just mentally unstable. And so first, I want to say to you, I want to connect with you after this because I like to be more involved with, with what you're doing because you're like, right, you're my neighbor practically. Absolutely. But um, I would really like to know um, if anyone knows, what can we do to, um, not so much about, yeah, what can we do, to, what can I do? Because it really, it broke my heart to see that I was the only person of color in that room. And I know that so many children need access to mental health mental health um, resources, and not like an intake where they're just using, you're just a number, and then eventually you're released out onto the street and you turn to a life of crime because you don't know what else to do. So if anybody knows, that's something that I'd really like to know because I really want to be involved in that because these are the people often affected by these misdemeanor crimes. It's something simple, and it doesn't, they don't have to result in being imprisoned. And so if anyone knows, I'll be around when it's, this is over. So um, thank you again for all of your work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Why accountability, you know, we're really, you know, side eye on the new recruits and stuff because everybody doesn't like to say FTP. But if anybody, you know, wants to lend their support by going to a precinct meeting, please. Um, I'm a mother of a 20-year-old son. I know I look really young, but my son will be 21 in just a few months. So I definitely can relate to the feeling and the overprotection of the, uh, your black male in the home, whether it's your husband, brother, child, or whatever, and their uh, way of socially interacting with other people could be construed as criminality by the police department. And we just had Deborah Dana you know, um, schizophrenic, diagnosed schizophrenic for decades. And why in the hell is NYPD responding to mental health crisis? Why? Okay, again, and uh, I say why facetiously because we already know the answer. Because the NYPD is the entry point to the criminal justice system. If Deborah Dana survived that incident, she might have had an assault on a police officer charge to go with her mental health crisis for which she would have needed bail and needed BK, well, not, she's, you know, in the X, but a community fund to assist her in her bail. So I can definitely relate to the things that, you know, you're bringing up. And I think one of the things that we can do in that type of uh, uh, restorative way is to cultivate alternatives to policing. 
You know, can we cultivate that where the community has resources that they can reach out to and say, okay, I know, you know, my aunt may get this way if certain circumstances come up. Let me have a cache of resources that I can uh, call on when I need assistance. Because we got the NYPD doing everything, like Gabriel said. They play basketball with your kid, they arrest your kid. They take your kid on trips, they arrest your kid. You know, they provide DV counseling and then they arrest you. You know, so everything in between is they will arrest you. Be clear, that's an a agency uh, for criminal justice or for crime. It's not for anything else. But we continue to stick them into areas where they do not belong. The police department is not DOE. Police department is not mental health. The police department is, is not the uh, office of domestic violence. It's just not. And we have to do more work in cultivating those alternatives so moms can send their children out and you don't have to constantly have your kid text you. Like, I'm here now. My son is probably texting me now because we do check-ins with each other because we have to, that's the emergency where we are. Because actually I have more of a fear, because actually my son was already assaulted by the police, let's be clear about that, that already happened. It's just like a dice roll, when it will happen to you, when you're gonna hit the four, the, the four five, six, for those of you that roll dice. Um, it already happened and it actually happened a year after my activism. So it wasn't because of that I became active. It was, I, I was active for about 15 months and my son was walking with this girlfriend. He went to go pick her up from work at 10 o'clock at night to make sure she was safe. And on his way home, they ran into a shooting investigation at my mother's complex. And the police basically piled on him similar to Eric Garner. So all he felt was knees on the neck, knees in the back. They destroyed his watch. They destroyed his cell phone. They didn't voucher all of the money he had with them because he was working at the time. And it took eight court appearances over 10 months and a $7,500 lawyer to get the case dismissed from September of 2015 to August of 2016. My son hasn't been back to school, he can't. He's not in the mood. Because when the cops beat him up, it was two days before school started to go back to college. So he hasn't been back since. So when people throw that nonsense out, oh, fight it out in court. Yeah, that's what fighting it out in court looks like. $7,500 from a working class municipal worker because I'm a municipal worker, I work for the city at my nine to five. So it cost me $7,500. That could have been the $7,500 on a down payment on a home somewhere. But then we could talk about how black people don't wanna get themselves together. How we continue to perpetuate the BS. So that was $7,500. I lost about 12 days from work. I still take off of work to go meet him when he has to go meet with his lawyers because you know he's suing the shit out the city. But um, yeah, so I totally relate to you. I would love to speak to you afterwards. But these are the things that you can think about when you want to you know, spew the classic stuff, fight it out in court, or well, if he just behaved himself, or blah, blah, blah. No, this is happening to real people, regular people, working class people that want to live in peace and with dignity and for society at large to value our lives, which is not happening. Hi. My name is Rena Karifa Johnson. Um, I'm asking a question on my behalf, but also I think on behalf of the people in the room. Um, the woman over there spoke a lot about being priced out of Brooklyn. We're in Brooklyn. Um, there's a lot of gentrification happening, and I think at least with people I know, a lot of people that are well-meaning and care a lot about these issues and don't want black people criminalized are also really struggling about what it means to be living in these mixed-income neighborhoods when they have that fear of Rahim. So I was wondering, like, as far as things people can do today, if you can offer alternatives to calling the police for people that are maybe living in neighborhoods where they're, they're, they are more proximate to things like drug use or 
poverty or things that make them uncomfortable and their first instinct might be to call the cops if you have like real things that people can do to not do that. Y'all talking about, you talking about white people that don't like when they come in and yes. hipsterize the neighborhood and they just sick of stuff that black and brown people do? That's internal issue that they have to deal with within themselves and stop that nonsense. Because what is it now? Loud music, they calling the police. Guys in front of their own building. You see these new landlords putting up those, those uh, wrought iron because they don't want people sitting on the stoop. And let me, and let me tell y'all how <laughs> institutional racism operate. Black people can't sit on the stoop anymore. But isn't there a, a, a white lady on one of the public channels that has a show called The Stoop? <laughs> okay? So that's what that's all about, too, because not only are we talking about, you know, criminal justice, there's also a cultural injustice where our mores, our folklore, our culture, our traditions, our ways of interacting get soaked up, criminalized, then exploited, and then profiteered with that stoop example. But that's an, inter that's an internal problem. And um, hey, I would advise people, protect yourself by forming a street patrol or a tenant group. So you can say to that neighbor, hey, wait a minute. You know, don't call the police. You know, don't, don't do it. But that, that's a cultural divide we have right now as the city is changing. I think that another thing that people can, can do, and I agree that it definitely comes from that. So I'm not from Brooklyn. Um, I'm from Oakland, California, uh, West Oakland specifically. <laughs> and I say that because I have for the past, I just moved here this summer. So for the past 10 years, I've watched my city and my neighborhood drastically change, right? And a lot of the, the issues that I've heard coming into Brooklyn as I before I came and was talking to friends, and then now that I've lived here, is a lot of those, those differences, right? Living in these mixed income neighborhoods now, um, and communities that are becoming more and more um, diverse. I think the, the biggest issue is that people don't know each other. There's a lot, so if we wanna talk about why people call the police, it's because you don't know your neighbors. Like there's, community means something, right? So if you're coming into a community, Get to know people, have conversations. A lot of that comes from fear, right? Like, so it is stuff that you have to deal with inside, but talk to people. If you're calling because there's somebody in front of your building who you don't know and you think is suspect, ask them a question. Get to know them, hi, how are you? Introduce yourself, like it's just some basic niceties that people don't do because of fear. Um, so starting there makes a huge difference. So I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I, I just want to, is this on? Oh. Okay, uh, one, of the, one, one of the things, ways that you can change the way people um, think about this is by changing the language. So one of the, one of the phrases I, I don't use anymore is people of color. White is a color. Mm -hmm. That, 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 that means all of us are, 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 are of, this, of this same humanity. So, so when you separate yourself out as to white and then people of color as something different, you, you've, 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 you've already done that. You've already privileged yourself, okay? Um, and the, uh, three years ago, I was arrested, okay? Now, now I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything criminal. All, all I did was get on the back of the bus uh, on a bus that we were allowed to get on the back of the, of, of the bus because it was going to Randall's Island, okay? And the cops were on the bus looking to arrest people. They were looking for it. And, and, and why was I arrested? The cop actually told me, all right, I just the white man because I didn't jump up and, 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 and uh, put my metro card in, in, in the slot, okay? The, the, the front was crowded, which is why the back door was open in the first place. <laughs> so this can happen to us. At any age, at, at any time, because no, a, a white woman my age, that would have never happened to. They handcuffed me and put me in jail, okay? Expressly to humiliate me. I was not humiliated, okay? I got, I got mad instead, okay? That, and you know, I decided I was gonna sue them and, and, and all of that. And they, came, and they literally came looking for me days later because I was going to Randall's Island to play soccer 
and they knew, and they knew that, and they, came, and they came to the gym where I played soccer. So, so the things that, that this affects all of our lives in, in ways that we, we don't even see coming. We don't, we, and we never know when it's going to happen to us. We're, we're always on edge. And it's, not, and it's not just the young men. Now that, now that it happened to me, I might, have, I, I might have thought that people were exaggerating until it happened to me three years ago. I, and, I, and I was just like, oh shit. <laughs> this, this happens. So, so when you separate yourself out as privileged and unprivileged, <laughs> As, 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 as not, as, I call myself an African descendant all the time. Amen. Okay. You're a European descendant probably, I'm guessing. Okay. But, but, but I, I don't call myself a minority either. I am not a minor. And I'm not a number. And I'm, and I'm not less than anything. So start changing the language about how you see others. And, then, and, 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 and that way you start changing your mindset. Thanks so much, everybody.